Welcome to Paris and your PCR 2023. My name is Matthias Gottberg. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Lund, Sweden. Today, I have Didier Cheche from Toulouse. Hi, Matthias. Welcome. And also Nicolas van Megen from Rotterdam. Hello, Matthias. Uh, the topic for today's uh, discussion is really about durability data with special emphasis on the five-year BVD data that is presented at PCR. Uh, so, Nicholas, uh, first of all, we need to discuss what is BVD, biovascular valve dysfunction, and how does that differ from the other definition of structural valve degeneration? Yeah. So, so, BVD basically has four major components. There is endocarditis and thrombosis, but the major components are structural and non-structural valve degeneration. And those are two fundamentally different mm. entities. So, in the structural valve degeneration, something is going wrong with the leaflets. By itself. In non-structural valve degeneration, basically as an operator you did something wrong at the index procedure because you did something wrong with the sizing and the patient has some patient prosthesis mismatch or there is a paravalvular leak. So those are the major components of BVD. So Nicholas, you are presenting the five-year data regarding BFD for the Evolute platform. Can you tell us a little bit about the study? Yeah, so it's Evolute and Core Valve. Um, what, we, what we did is um, we combined the randomized control data from the uh, high-risk and the intermediate SIRTAVI uh, randomized control trial, comparing surgery with TAVI, with Core Valve or Evolute. At the same time, we also enriched that data with continuous access data. So basically, we ended up with almost 5,000 patients, a lot of data sets. The randomized control data was then used to compare surgery with TAVI. Then the enriched data sets, so almost 5,000 patients, was used to look for predictors and the association of bioprosthetic valve degeneration with clinical outcome. So quite, quite interesting data. So a very large data set, combination of randomized, non-randomized data, really trying to have enough power to look at these predictors, right? Oh yeah, so, yeah. So, and that was the, the purpose of the, uh, the enrichment. And the, the findings were, were surprising, in my opinion, because uh, Didier, what, what I always thought was, mm. okay, you know, um, probably when we see a difference in BVD, then that might be more patient prosthesis mismatch with surgery, right? Because, yeah. because an Evolute or a core valve, your hemodynamic valve performance should be better. Yeah, that's... Um a quite constant finding when you look at all these data coming from the randomized trial, there is a constant superiority of TAVI devices, TAVI prosthesis, particularly the self-expanding supra mm -hmm. platforms in terms of hemodynamics with larger EOAs and lower mean gradients. So it's, uh, that's something that intuitively uh, seems clear to our mind, but overall, the overall uh, uh, phenotype of uh, bioprosthetic valve dysfunction being lower in the uh, TAVI group is quite a surprise to me. And I have to say that it's, uh, it's quite reassuring. It's quite reassuring because we are Sorry. seeing the widespread utilization of TAVI. And to be able to tell our patient that uh, we have selected TAVI for you uh, instead of surgery because we think that it's the best choice and we have data now that support a better, um, maybe not durability because it's only five years, but at least better function of the device up to five years. And this is really reassuring for our patients, I would say. And at the same time, it is also important to realize there is no issue of endocarditis or valve thrombosis when you use a transcatheter valve versus a surgical. But the eye catcher, in my opinion, was the difference in structural valve degeneration. Because these, these transcatheter valves were not degenerating faster than a structural valve. To the contrary, we had 4% structural valve degeneration after surgery versus only 2% with TAVI. So basically that also questions this, this narrative from the early days that, you know, we don't know anything about durability and the bar is what surgery has put there. But the question is, is that really fair? Yeah. Because we see a different scenario here. Indeed, so structural valve degeneration is obviously very important. And I think that probably we see a difference here between a superannular prosthesis versus intraannular prosthesis. If you look at, for instance, the partner uh, data looking at uh, BVD mm -hmm. at five years, it doesn't look as good. So obviously this is reassuring data. Um, within BVD, there's also non-structural valve degeneration. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the non-structural valve degeneration basically revolves around prosthetic patient mismatch. 
and paravalvular leads. Yeah. And I think we see a clear trend with the new device iterations that PVL is becoming a thing of the past. In the early days, we suffered from that in the transcatheter space, but that has changed. I think with the new uh, ceiling fabric that we have with the contemporary devices, paravalvular leak, it's fair to say yeah. it's relatively rare, right? And one uh, question that I have for, to you, uh, non-structural valve deterioration was uh, more frequent after surgery, but was it more driven by patient, severe patient prosthesis mismatch or also paravalvular regurgitation? No, that was a driver. The driver was really prosthesis patient mismatch. And obviously, um, and this is an interesting side step, if you look at the low risk trials, surgery was also getting better. And that means that also the surgical community is paying much more attention in implanting devices with a relatively larger size. They are respecting more the anatomies and they try to prevent mm. this patient prosthesis mismatch with, with root enlargements and, uh, yeah. and other techniques that they have. Uh, so looking at the CRT data, <clears throat> sorry, the data presented as CRT, the five-year data on structural valve degeneration, there was a difference obviously in the small annuli. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the BVD data and also you know, whether that expands to the other valve sizes? Yes, it, it did. But obviously, the, as expected, I would say, the, the results were more uh, enhanced in the smaller valves, but they, they, they were also present uh, in the larger size valve. So, and the cutoff of a small and a large is 23 millimeters. So if you would uh, have a surgical valve of 23 or above, then you would compare it with an Evolute 29 or an Evolute 34. Uh, well, you see basically the same trends, the same things happening. So there is a, the, the difference is the, the difference in favor of transcatheter valve implantation is maintained. Yeah. So Didier, uh, you, these data is obviously very reassuring for uh, superannual prosthesis. Yeah. How does it affect your clinical practice? Any difference in the choice between TAVR and SAVR, and any difference in terms of superannular versus intraannular prosthesis uh, choice? Uh, so Matthias, these are key questions for our daily practice and we are all discussing and talking about the sequence. How are we going to select the first index procedure for our patient? Because if the patient, we are dealing with a lower, lower, younger, uh, patient, lower risk younger patients, we need to make sure that we're gonna find the proper sequence for all his life expectancies. If you start with uh, surgery, we have discussed the risk of higher BVD, at least up to four year, uh, five years follow-up. If you start with TAVI, there is all that issue of explaining the devices. So I would say that I would select the device that has the longer durability and getting this uh, five years data on BVD is really reassuring. We can apply this to our younger patients uh, and anticipate a uh, longer uh, lasting uh, device for this patient. So I would say self-expanding supranular platform at least for the hemodynamic perspective, makes sense for younger patients. Uh, to get a clear comparison, self-expanding balloon expandable, I would say let's wait, for instance, for uh, uh, the results of the SMART trial that compared uh, Evolute to sapient-free and small annuli. And we've seen that BVD is more frequent in small annuli, mm -hmm. and this is going to provide us clear answers with clear answers uh, um, for this matter. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So this is really sort of older patients, it's a higher risk cohort. So what about the younger patients and, and you know, the result in low risk trials? Do we have any data that supports this use? Yeah, so another piece of reassuring data with that self-expanding platform, you know that the Evolute low risk trial was a randomized trial that compared surgery to TAVI with the Evolute platform in younger and lower risk patients. But the mean age was uh, still about 74, 74, so young, but not as young at, as one could expect. Um, there was an advantage or equivalence in terms of uh, so rates of mortality and uh, uh, so uh, rehospitalization, all cause mortality and, sorry, all cause mortality and stroke uh, for uh, between surgery and uh, TAVI with the Evolute platform equivalence and that was uh, maintained at two years and now we have the data at three years. The overall rate of stroke or mortality is about 10% uh, for uh, surgery while it's 7% uh, at three years for uh, TAVI. So there is still that delta of 3% that is maintained from one year to two years to three years telling us that 
potentially there is a kind of advantage of the uh, self-expanding platform in low risk patient. And if we match that with the durability data that we have at five years, that is quite reassuring. There was an excess of paravalvular regurgitation moderate in the TAVI arm, more uh, atrial fibrillation in the surgical uh, arm, and as one could expect, more pacemaker requirements in uh, the TAVI arm. So these are, uh, these are some differences. I, I would want to cl clarify this because there yep. was no moderate PVL anymore in the two arms. There was no diff uh, there was marginally, but there was no yeah, difference yeah. between no the two treatments. Significant difference. Yes, mm. but there was a uh, mild PVL in 20% of the TAVI cases versus uh, I think two or three or four percent yeah, in the surgical, that's it, in the surgical, surgical cases. And, and again, that also attests to how these devices are iterating and how that they are getting better and the difference between uh, TAVI and surgery in terms of uh, end result of PVL, it's really narrowing, the gap is closing. So it's I getting, think- it's, it's gonna improve with the pro. Oh huh? yeah. With the pro. Huh? Yeah. Because that's also an important yeah, uh, exactly. finding, right? Because we're talking here about Evolute, Evolute R. R. We're not talking about Evolute Pro Plus that yeah, we're yeah. using these days. And, and you know, you can only anticipate yeah. it getting better and better. Yeah, and FX is also around the corner. Yeah. Like this pretty soon. So, so uh, you know, summing up these data, uh, you know, how do you integrate that into your clinical practice when it comes to valve choice? I mean, obviously PVL is not anything that is really of any concern in the majority of the patients. Uh, what about durability and valve choice? Do you integrate that when you implant your valves? I find that a difficult mm -hmm. question because there, there are so many layers to that question. Uh, also, we, we have to refer to pacemakers, for instance. There still is this pacemaker uh, in, an issue in, it does in the low risk. It, it it's does definitely improve. improving, it does but improve. it still was 20% in the low risk. Yeah. But with the new techniques, cusp overlap and the modifications, we are getting to the it's single digits, yeah. so definitely getting better. At the same time, uh, I find it difficult to compare one device with the other in the absence of, of well-powered head-to-head comparisons. Obviously, we have that knowledge that hemodynamic valve performance, as assessed by ECHO, is superior in a, mm. a self-expanding, super annular functioning valve. But does that translate into better clinical outcome? There is no indication for that. There is no, I mean, we don't have the size to back that up. So I typically now have um, a practice of a more anatomy tailored platform selection. Exactly. So the, the, the anatomy will determine which device I will use. And I have the luxury and I think all of the three of us have the luxury to have multiple platforms uh, in our, uh, on our shelves and, and it, that also makes a difference, I feel. So, yeah, I have to say that I have exactly the same philosophy. It's more the anatomy that is going to guide the choice of the platform. And we know that we are getting better at understanding what is going to be the TAV in TAV uh, yeah. scaffolding that we're going to uh, place within the patients. And all these simulation that we uh, get from these companies that I'm not going to name are really useful to f think about the second step uh, when we treat a patient, particularly a younger, lower risk patient. Yeah, so, so I, I think this is really the, the essential of it. I think that we, in 2023, we all expect to have excellent outcomes with TAVI. We have mature programs or high volume centers. So it comes down to making the decision on valve choice based on obviously yeah. anatomy, making the right mm -hmm. choice the first time, also re-intervention, coronary access, pacemakers, all those needs to be integrated into the practice. So I, I find that these, the five-year BVD data is, of course, very reassuring. And in terms of surgery versus low risk, the three-year data where you actually have borderline significant yeah. better results with TAVI versus Saber, or at least very reassuring when I have the discussion at the multidisciplinary team meetings uh, regarding the choice between TAVI and Saber. So uh, thank you very much for joining us here. Um, Great pleasure. Thank you.